this and I will send you a link as to how to see the recording when we're done. It probably won't be available till tomorrow morning. Okay, no if worries. I want to go over one thing with you really quick. I, I mean, I know you have some material you want to go over, but this is key. This is really key. Okay. And it regards the question we ran into the last time I saw you, which was that you had a velocity function, which is my top graph, and you have the acceleration function, which is my bottom graph. And we had a question is, where is it speeding up? And for me, that's always been one of the more difficult things to understand about calculus, because getting acceleration and velocity, uh, if you think of acceleration, you would think, well, negative acceleration sounds like it's slowing down, but that's not the case. Notice, right, it's just pushing it to the left. Well, notice right. what's happening here. Let's look at the velocity curve. Let's assume you have a car, okay? Starts out at zero. Can you see my cursor at all? Yeah. Okay, good. So the car starts out at zero at time zero. Then it accelerates to 30 miles an hour at one second. Then it accelerates to 60 miles an hour at three seconds, all of which time velocity is positive and increasing. Yes. Then the velocity starts to slow down after from three seconds to whatever that number is there. Velocity slows all the way to zero. Well, mm -hmm. notice the rules about functions and their derivatives. In other words, I drew this acceleration curve based on the velocity curve. In other words, because velocity was increasing from zero to three, I knew acceleration had to be positive. Right. Not to say whether it's increasing or decreasing, I just know it's positive. If the original function is increasing, then the first derivative is positive. At three seconds, okay. velocity reaches a horizontal asymptote with a slope of zero. That means acceleration has to be zero at that point. Yes. Now, from three seconds to, we'll call that seven seconds, velocity is decreasing on the graph. But it's not really decreasing. What's happening is it's going from 60 to zero, and it's switching directions and going left and speeding up. In other words, the velocity is going from zero there to 30 miles an hour to the left there, to 60 miles an hour to the left there. So All right. we're trying to figure out whether that x particle on the, or whether that particle on the x-axis, which is a problem you're going to have repeatedly in calculus, that's not going away. That's, that's one of their prime problems is a, the particle moving along the x-axis, okay? Notice that from this point to this point, particle is speeding up. It's going right. from it's going to the left, but it's going 30 miles an hour to the left, and then it's going 60 miles an hour to the left. So it's speeding up even though the acceleration is still negative. Gotcha. So you cannot look at acceleration to determine whether a particle is speeding up or slowing down. You have to look at velocity. And remember what speed is. It is the absolute value of velocity. Notice what yeah. I drew on there. What I now have is speed, not S of T, but speed. And now I can just look at this curve, and it's speeding up from 0 to 3 seconds. It's slowing down from 3 to 5 seconds. It's speeding up again from 5 to 7 seconds. And then it's slowing down. Okay. 
So you're not really looking at the acceleration curve because acceleration can be negative or it can be positive and it could be speeding up in both situations. So that was always one of the toughest things for me to understand about calculus is the concept of speeding up or slowing down doesn't really depend on the acceleration curve. It depends on the velocity curve. All right. Gotcha. And it's like the absolute value. And uh, you know what I mean by absolute value. In other words, if I have a function like this, and I want to plot the absolute value of it, well, anything that's negative gets reflected over the x-axis, and I end up with that. In other words, I end up with this curve. If I take the absolute value of my first curve, I end up with the red curve. And that's really the easiest way. Well, it's hard to do that if they've given you the function. In other words, I didn't give you what the velocity function was. I just drew it. Same with the acceleration function. If they actually give you the function, then you have to break it down. In other words, um, when velocity is positive and it's increasing, it's speeding up. When velocity is negative and it's decreasing, it's speeding up. This part right here is speeding up. Okay. Okay? All right. Yep. Wanted to make that clear. What do you got for me today? Well, so I have, he gave us a review packet. Okay. And then I also have my previous quiz. So I want to go over some things on my previous quiz first. All right. I think I'm just going to take some pictures and send it to you. That's the probably the best way. Uh, some some calculus problems you can verbalize, but some it's tough. Yeah. Um, where am I? Let me write the email you should send it to. This gets to me the quickest. That's 1949 at Gmail. Dot com. All right. And do you have an iPhone? I do. That's what I'm sending it on. Make sure you send it as an attachment and as a large file, not a small image, but a large image. And send it as an attachment, not in the main body of the email. Okay. And only send one picture with your first email. The more pictures you attach, the longer it takes to get to me. So if you attach like four pictures, it might take four minutes to get to me. If you attach just one, I'll get it pretty quick, and then you can attach more, and we can do more of them afterwards. But so that we can get started right away, I would only attach one picture to the first email. Gotcha. Okay, it has been sent. Okay. And um, you put the 1949 on there? Yes. Okay. Sometimes it takes a second or two. And you spelled it exactly like that? Let's see what I said. Um. Sent. Oh, it's currently sending. Okay. Thanks. Hasn't quite. Is it not? Yeah. And sometimes that's just a function of how fast the internet is at any given time. If you know, if internet is particularly slow right now, then it'll take a few more seconds to get to me, and even be sent. It says my server failed. Ooh, yikes. Hmm. Okay, let me just tell you what it is then. All right. Um, it's five sine, and then it's sine of 4x plus 11. And what do they need you to do? Take the... Uh, just find... I don't know why this was so challenging, but I got way off on this one. 
What, what, uh, the second derivative. Second derivative, okay. Well, let's take the first derivative. What's the first derivative? The first derivative will give you um, 5 cosine of 4 plus 11 times 4. Hold on. Never, when you're doing the derivative of the outside, in other words, you have to apply the chain rule here. Have you had, okay. have you had chain rule? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the first step is to take the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. This is the derivative of the outside. In other words, you do not change the argument. Is all you're doing is taking the derivative of sine, and that's cosine. So it becomes cosine of the same argument. Then right, so multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is what? Which would be 4. Okay, and I'll put that there. So now that gives so 20 us cosine. 20 cosine of 4x plus 11. And take the second derivative, which is the first derivative of that. So what's the derivative of the outside? It would be 20, or negative 20 sine. Um, Never times change the argument. Never change the argument. We're going to have to take the derivative of the argument as the derivative of the inside, but do not change that argument when you're taking the derivative of the outside. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I just... Okay. So I just put the have first derivative. Divide this by four. Right. Okay. So the answer should be minus eighty sine of four x plus eleven. Gotcha. All right. That was a stupid mistake as well. Right. Most of these are stupid that mistakes. That applies. That applies if I'm taking the log of x squared plus two. That's 1 over x squared plus 2, that's the derivative of the outside, times the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So this is a key principle in the chain rule, is you do not take the derivative of the inside as your first step. That's always the second step. Right. You're taking the derivative of the outside only when I get this part right here, 5 cosine of 4x plus 11, that's the derivative of the outside. Understood. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Let's go to the packet. Okay. Hmm. Okay. This one says, uh, take or find the derivative if x cubed y plus x y cubed equals negative 10. Okay, so you've gotten into implicit differentiation. I do incidentally have your book, the Finney, DeMana, Waits, and Kennedy calculus book. My edition is just the second edition, so you probably have a higher edition, but that usually doesn't make much difference. They're, they're pretty similar other than maybe a few yeah, specific problems. All right, let's talk about implicit differentiation. It's actually almost easier than explicit differentiation. Okay? What I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the derivative of the left side with respect to x, and I'm going to write it like that. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the right side. I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x. Just like any algebra equation, you can do the same thing to the left as you're doing to the right. Now, here's the key. When I run into an x variable, I can differentiate it explicitly. But if I run into any variable other than x, I have to differentiate it and then follow it with a dy dx. Right. Okay. So let's go through an example. Okay. So I'm I get to this problem here, and the first thing I realize is I got to use the product rule, right? In other yep. words, that's a product. So 
The product rule says I'm going to take the first term multiplied by the derivative of the second term. And since I just took the derivative of y and y isn't x, I have to follow it with a dy dx. Okay. Now I'm still okay. in this term here. I'm still in the product rule in this first term. And the second part says I'm going to take the derivative of the first term, which is 3x squared, and multiply it by the second term. Since I'm not taking the derivative of y, I don't have to put a dy dx after that. Right. Okay. Now, I'm getting to this term here. Again, the product rule. So the product rule says the first term times the derivative of the second term, 3y squared, followed by dy dx. Yes. Plus the reverse of that, well, the derivative of x is 1. And again, I'm not doing anything with the y term, so I do not follow it with a dy dx. Okay, I got that. Get to the other side, the derivative of any constant is zero. Right. Okay. Now, it's now just, well, this is just difficult algebra, and it's not even that difficult. First of all, I can remove my parentheses since there's no subtraction going on. Don't need the parentheses. Don't need that one. Don't need that one. Now let's, we're trying to solve for dy dx, right? Yes. Okay. We want to take every single term that has dy dx and put it on one side of the equation and everything else on the other. Well, that term has a dy dx in it. That term has a dy dx in it. So let's put those on the left side. And are you comfortable with me calling that y prime? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I take this other thing, x3y squared y prime, and I move the other terms to the other side because they don't have a dy dx in them. With me? Yeah. Now, factoring. That's always where everybody gets tripped up. If you're trying to solve for y prime, factor it out. What's left? Uh, the three or the x to the third plus three uh, x y squared. Okay, and I still have the same thing I had on the other side. Now to oh, so then you divide. Yeah, now you just divide by this coefficient. So my answer is, let's see, I'll put this in highest degree first. That's what was over there. And I'm going to divide by that coefficient. Well, that coefficient is x cubed plus 3xy squared. That is your answer. And the one difference between explicit and implicit differentiation is when you differentiate explicitly, your answer is always a function of x. When you differentiate implicitly, you frequently have x and y in your answer. So you really have a function of x and y. Which yeah. okay, because if they said to you, well, what is the derivative when um, x is equal to 3? But usually they'll give you both points. When x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 4, or I could write that like that, at that point there, what's the slope? Whenever they say what's the slope, they mean what's the first derivative? Well, I go up into this function, and wherever I see x, I plug in 3. Wherever I see y, I plug in 4, and I come up with a number. 
That's okay. slope at that point. This function might be, you know, funny looking. It might look like that. But if I go to the point 3 comma 4, let's say that point right there, and I wanted to know what the slope of that was, I'm going to plug it into my answer, and I will get the slope of that straight line. All right. Okay. Cool. The thing about implicit differentiation is the following. If... I had something like this, the equation of a circle, okay? I could actually solve this for y. y ends up being plus or minus the square root of 9 minus x squared, and I could and explicitly differentiate it, okay? I would have to do it in pieces because I got a plus part and I got a minus part, so I'd have to do two different differentiations. But if I'm willing to do implicit differentiation, what does it become? Implicitly uh, differentiate this for relative to... It would be 2x plus 2y, y prime. Correct. Equals zero. And then, Equals zero. And then you solve for y prime. Well, in this particular problem... I was able to do it either way, okay? I could have done it explicitly or implicitly. If we go back to the problem we were just looking at, hmm, tell me I'm not going to be able to do that. I guess not. Um, if we go back to a problem like this, x cubed minus x squared y cubed plus y equals 10, I can't solve that for y. I don't have any algebra that allows me to solve that for y. Right. And there's so lots of functions help. like that. You can take hyperbolas, ellipses, circles. There's all kinds of functions. Those are actually not functions, but they're relations. But you can take all kinds of things that look like functions and implicitly differentiate it where you would not be able to explicitly differentiate. The only way to differentiate that thing is implicitly. Because I, because I cannot solve for y. So implicit differentiation is huge. And let me say one last thing about implicit differentiation that's really important. Let's say that I was decided to implicitly differentiate that, but with respect to some variable that's not either x or y but t, which is what happens when you get to related rates. It's always being differentiated with respect to t, or 95% of the time. Okay, well, I'm going to do the same thing. Whenever I run into a variable that is not t, I got to follow it with dx dt. So if I were to do this, it would be 3x squared. Now you can't really use the primes. You got to do it this way dx dt, and in other words, when I run into y, I got to follow it with a dy dt. When I run into x, I got to follow it with a dx dt. And notice t is not even in this equation. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Does not matter. That'll happen a lot, where the variable okay. that you're differentiating with respect to is not even one of the variables in the equation. The only thing you have to remember is that when you run into a variable different than this variable, you have to follow it with a d whatever dt. Okay. All right. What okay. Else? What else do you have? One more question. Okay. So this says, find the average rate of change of the function over the given interval. Okay. So here's what it says. f of x equals... 4x to the third plus 3x to the second uh, minus 6. And the range is 2 to 6. You have not had integrals yet, have you? I don't believe so. Because there is an integral that gives you average. But 
average is f of b minus f of a all divided by b minus a. In other words, whatever this function looks like, that's a cubic, so it might look something like that, okay? They want the average rate of change from 2 to 6. How are we going to get the average rate of change? We're going to take the rise and divide it by the run. The rise being, and that's why they called it f of x instead of y. It's a better notation for calculus by a lot. <laughs> Notice what the rise is. It's f of 2, f of 6 minus f of 2. In other words, another right. important concept here is that is f of 6. That value right there is f of 2. So the rise and the run is f of 6 minus f of 2. That's the rise. And the run is so you just plug it in. minus 2. Exactly. In other words, you know how to figure out what f of 6 is, right? Okay, yeah. Just plug in 6 for x. And plug in 2. And 2 for x. Subtract those two numbers. Divide it by 4. That's your average rate of change. Average rate of change is not a calculus problem. That's an algebra problem. Right. Okay. okay. Calculus is always instant rate of change. In other words, the average rate of change is just the slope between those two points right there. Instant rate of change changes between 2 and 6 all over the place. It, the instant rate of change is that, and then that, and then that, and then that, and then that. See what I'm doing? Yeah. Instant rate of change is what's hard to figure out, and that's what requires calculus. Average rate of change is just algebra 2. Mm-hmm. But it's important to remember, average rate of change is rise over run. And this notation, f of 6 minus f of 2, notice that if we go back to differentiation, the definition of differentiation is f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Well, there's x. There's x plus h. Here's a function. This value here is f of x. This value here is f of x plus h. So if I want the average rate of change, I get this. I get f of x plus h minus f of x, which is the rise. And I get x plus h minus x which is the run, which equals h. And, and that's instant. Right. That's like, Only okay. if I take the limit as h approaches 0. In other words, as h approaches 0, this point here comes closer and closer to the first point, and I'm going to end up with the slope of the tangent line at x. All right. One more thing. Before you, before we have to end this, uh -huh. can you explain briefly what left-hand derivatives and right-hand derivatives are? Sure. While we're on this note. Sure. Let's talk about left-hand limits and right-hand limits. Well, I know about the limits. I just don't know what they're asking for when you say left-hand derivative and right-hand derivative. I don't think it's any different. Okay. In other words, if I wanted the left-hand derivative, I'd want the slope of that tangent line at the point, let's call that 2. If I want the right-hand derivative, I want the slope of that tangent line. So as all you would do is, this a piecewise function, Whatever your function is for that, take the derivative of it, evaluate it at 2, and you've just taken the right-hand derivative. 
If you want the left-hand derivative evaluated at 2, take this function, take the derivative of it, evaluate it at 2. And you could easily get different slopes. Okay. So that's all it is. Um, it, in fact, it's nothing particularly confusing. Just if, if you have a piecewise function, make sure you use the correct function. In other words, if you're taking the left-hand derivative, you've got to use this function here. If you're taking the right-hand derivative, you've got to use that function. Okay. If you're taking it at All right. point two. Okay, understood. Okay. I think those are the big questions that I had. Okay. Um, any last questions? Uh, we're just about to 3 o'clock here, but uh, I can take a few extra minutes if you need it. Um, I think we're good. Okay. I had a lot of my questions answered in class, too. So okay. That was good. So now is all we have to do is figure out what happened to your email. Ah, I got it. Oh, there it goes. Let me show you how this works, just because that's a big part of tutoring is being able to have you send me material and that's what would happen is we would work on these problems like this okay okay and so forth and so on well this looks special would you want me to send those to you beforehand or that's probably best um, just because if you wait until we start a session, particularly if it's only a half hour session, you know, we don't want to waste five minutes of our half hour having you do that. So the sooner you send them, the better. And if it happens to be super difficult material, it gives me a chance to look at it before we have a session. So, um, okay. helpful in a couple different ways, but yeah, um, like you said, uh, 16 is very easy to verbalize. And I, who yep. cares if it was multiple choice? I didn't need the multiple choice. You shouldn't either. The multiple choice uh, yeah. do not do any good other than alert you to the fact you've made a mistake. If you do make a mistake, you know, if it's or it just messes on, you up further like this one was. Was that? Yeah. But if the answer isn't on there, at least it tells you you've made a mistake and you got to go back and rethink it. But yeah. in general, the multiple choice doesn't help. You should be able to. You should know how to take that derivative, with or without multiple choice. Yeah, looking back on it now, I think I just took the first derivative and now, then just didn't do anything. It looked like what you did was you combined the chain rule. You took the derivative of the outside and then you changed the argument to be the derivative of the inside, and that's what you don't want to do. And, in fact, okay. that's not the derivative of the inside, 4 plus 11. The derivative of the inside right, is... Right, it's supposed to be 4x, four. but I was, just, just, I was in a hurry. Yeah. So the, the thing to remember is you, on when you're taking the derivative of the outside, never change the argument. The argument stays the same. Right. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. All right. Matthew, good luck. Well, thanks so much. I hope that was helpful. I know. Um, and... By tomorrow morning, I will send your email a link to see a recording of this, if you ever want to watch the recording of it. Um, sometimes with really difficult material, it can be very useful, because there might be just okay. one part that you didn't get, and when you watch the recording, you can fast forward it to that point and spend five minutes watching it and clear up a whole lot of stuff. So the recordings can be really useful. I think, particularly on hard material yeah. like calculus. I agree. All right. Matthew, All right. have a good day. I will uh, talk to you next time. You too. See you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.